So today we're going to up the ante a bit and improve NumPy vectorization speed by about another five-fold. So you're gonna help us out with that, Chain? Yep! Lovely enough! Ugh. <laughs> yeah, so he's helping us out. He's gonna... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, we, we you said it's inefficient. How do you know that it's inefficient? How how do you know that at some like when we look at this code, how do we know that we can do better? We know because we can calculate it. So we know for each of the operations we want to perform what their complexity is and more or less how many operations that should take on your CPU. And we simply can go through analyzing the code and uh, doing some multiplications here and there and find out how many operations in an optimal case this would perform. So let's take a look at the code. How would you analyze this piece of code? So for each line, you have to consider its context. And at the beginning, it starts out pretty easy that there, each line there is only going to be run once. Uh, so we simply take the complexity of that line on its own. But once it starts getting run in loops, we need to take the complexity of that line and multiply it by the number of times that loop will be run. And for each loop that runs inside another loop, they keep multiplying. That's exactly what causes the problem in this algorithm. Uh, I think that's in computer science what people call complexity. Is, is that right? <laughs> yes, that's definitely complexity, although it's actually pretty simple. Okay, so com complexity as in like how long or an estimate of how long this code is going to take to run. Yes, so it's it's not simply an estimate. Sometimes people will get confused, but this is telling you, in the worst case, what would an optimal implementation require. So let's take a look at the uh, simplified version of our Python here that shows uh, when we begin, we create the curves, which is just our list of lists, by uh, creating one random number, for each of the elements in C, which is the uh, length of your curve or time series data, and then re performing that once for each curve that you're trying to track or find the similarities for. So we want to explain this computational complexity in terms of a few different factors. Uh, one of them is how many curves you have. One of them is how long those curves are. Um, and then there are a couple of smaller factors, such as how difficult is it to compute a square, or how difficult is it to initialize an array, an empty array, or how difficult is it to create a random number. So we just gave these letters like C for how many curves, R for how difficult it is to create that random number. So we have that, and uh, what, what does the, we have an estimate of the, or the product of R and C and other things, what do we do next? So as we continue here, we're going to uh, start finding the similarities between the curves we just made. And uh, obviously we're going to have one answer for every curve. So that's first line, uh, we're going to create an empty list, which is uh, essentially free. It has a, it has a cost, but um, since it's constant, it's not really something we have to worry about. Um, and then we're going to perform this computation to find the best neighbor for each curve. And that's what begins this for loop. So everything else in that uh, for loop is going to be multiplied by C. Okay, now we do two more constant, uh, a constant operations, which is to have a place to store the location for best curve um, and the current best error we found. Um, those two are going to cost us C because each one of them is constant. That's very simple to do, but it will have to be done once for every curve. As we move a little bit further in, now we have every pair of curves that we're going to compare. And that's how we've gotten into C times C or C squared complexity. So everything inside there is going to be multiplied by C squared. So let's move a tad bit further down. 
we want to avoid identity matrices here. We're just saying that it's not a very interesting result to say that the most similar curve to x is x. I don't care. Uh, I want to find the most similar curve that's not the same one. Okay, so comparing these two, notice I used is. Um, in Python, this is a big deal. Is is a constant time operation. It just tells you if you're talking about exactly the same list. It's not like equals, which is where we say if the contents of the list are similar. Um, so when we let me interject, are you saying that when we use equal or the two double equal, then it has to go through the whole list to check it? Yes. So what would be the complexity for that one? It actually depends. So it would be normally linear time to the length of that list. But keep in mind that that list can have references to itself or all kinds of other things because Python is very flexible. Okay, thanks. So we use an is, the is not here. What's, what's going on here? Um, I'm trying to perform a much cheaper operation where I know either the curves are exactly the same object or they're not equal. So I don't want to perform the deep check. I simply wanted to check if these refer to exactly the same location in memory, which is very easy and will give me, in my particular case, the same result as equals. Okay, so as we keep moving on, we're going to go find the error between these two curves. Um, so this is just the sum of squared error, which is uh, super simple to understand, um, but actually pretty useful. So we're simply literally using sum here. Um, we take the, the difference between them and then raise it uh, to the second power. Now you can fiddle with this a lot. Maybe you want to take the difference twice and multiply them because power can be an expensive operation, but usually your compiler will figure this out for you. Python won't, but some compilers will. Um, at any rate, that, that level of optimization is probably not going to make a big difference yet. Um, but we can see now this sum, that particular square and difference are going to be multiplied by s. So that is, we're looking at the length of this curve, okay? So we're going by how many curves times how many curves times the length of that curve multiplied by however difficult it is to, um, to perform that one squared difference. That's a very complicated operation in terms of computational complexity. So we should very closely inspect how efficient this particular line is. So uh, could you sh could you show us how you and uh, why do you say it's slow or why do you, why do you think we can do better? So depending on your computer, you can usually calculate exactly what uh, number of floating point operations per second your computer can perform. Um, and in the case of my computer, I have a you know relatively new MacBook that can do about three hundred and sixty. Uh, gigaflops. So I should be able to do 360 billion floating point operations per second. Now those operations are all of the usual arithmetic except division. Um, and uh, it's, it's of course always taken in the most optimal situation, which is usually fuse multiply add. Um, so you would expect that when you write it yourself, you'll not get but maybe 25% of that actual uh, number, but it's a good place to start. And we are quite a ways away from that. So when we look at this most difficult line, your most uh, complex line, it's going to be executed C, or the number of curves, times C, or the number of curves, um, times s, the length of the curve, times j, which is however difficult it is to subtract and then take the square, times. So that's how many times that will be uh, repeated, um, or how many difficult that operation will be. Um, now if we know that c, or the number of curves, is 1000, then we can say that c squared times s times j will end up being 1000 squared times 1000, times even if we just make a guess that maybe j is 10, okay, then we'll end up with 10 billion operations. So 
there's some flexibility in how difficult this query route could be, but it's not hundreds and it's not one. It's we're just getting an order of magnitude here. It's about 10 operations. So in that case, we should expect 10 billion. Now, this means that we, we should be getting much, much faster results, um, which in the completely optimal case would be a fraction of a second. Um, but even if it was very inefficient by an order of another extra order of magnitude, then we should expect it to take about one second. Okay. Now, uh, my estimate, which I had a couple more uh, bits of information to put together for this, which are only specific to my computer, you'll need to look at the white papers for your computer. I could estimate that it would take just a little bit under four seconds to group them all. Um, so the, uh, the estimate there leads us to believe that we can do a whole lot better. That's really all it comes down to. We can cut this down to somewhere around four seconds from the six minutes it was. So I think our conclusion is that we can do much better. And because we saw that it took six minutes to run, but our estimate is it shouldn't exceed 10 seconds. Can you give us our um, audience a little bit about how are we going to improve on this? Yes. Uh, we simply know that Python is being much more flexible than we need in this case. And we know that as a result of this flexibility, things are not being stored contiguously in memory. They're not stored together. So a lot of what we're bringing to the CPU is either trash or needs to be reorganized before we can perform that computation. How can we minimize the trash when we have a loop of loops? Yeah, so in this uh, particular context, we're trying to find the similarities between curves. And we know uh, that we're going to use these curves contiguously. We're going to run through them from the beginning to the end. And we want to keep all of that data together so that when we read it from memory or from whatever caches are there, uh, we want to use all of the results that we get. So really, uh, there's only one format that makes any sense, and that's to have no trash. We simply keep the numbers one right after the other. And since they already have a clear binary format, they're going to be probably four or eight bytes, depending on your uh, um, your choice of precision, <clears throat> you would uh, you would simply store them in that format. Now, once you have that format, using it is actually very clear. So, if you want to uh, to perform, say, this subtraction and then squaring, then uh, it, it's actually pretty simple. We simply start off with the first element of both of these lists, subtract them, square that one element and then add it to our uh, accumulator and then repeat. Now, that's how we would do it in C, but Python NumPy makes this a whole lot easier for us. Well, maybe not a whole lot, it's not complicated. It's just a few lines to think about. All we have to say is we take both halves of the, the vector, subtract them, and then uh, multiply, then add, or uh, do each of those operations as if we were only talking about one element, but it applies it to all of the elements in that vector, it gets us the result for that whole vector. Um, it's actually super easy to do, and uh, all that really changed for us is that we talk about the whole vector at once as if it was one thing. Um, we have to guarantee that all of the types in that vector are the same, like we can't have nuns in the middle of it, and we can't have a list or something in the middle of it. Um, and because of those uh, guarantees that we've made for it, we can remove the unnecessary flexibility and uh, give the CPU a much simpler job to, to complete. So Sean, um, how do we actually change our code so it doesn't take all the trash with it? In this case, it's super simple. There are just two lines we need to change. Uh, the first line involves changing the inner list um, for blah, blah, blah in C. We're going to replace that with numpy.array and convert that immediately. Um, then a little bit later on, where we were doing sum over the difference and uh, all that line, we're instead going to subtract two vectors 
and take that square and then take the sum of that vector and that's it. Uh, we just do it with the whole vector at once. So my takeaway is that if we organize the data and remove some trash, then we can achieve much more efficient computation. And looks like there are, uh, there are several steps we took here. What are the steps and what do we do? Okay, so the first step was moving from SQL to list of lists. We threw out lots of indices and we gave up flexibility on having uh, on uh, avoiding to store empty entries. Um, then our second step was from list of lists to NumPy, and that's because we gave up flexibility on having data types other than, say, float or integer inside our arrays. And so in both of those steps, we got vast computational improvement. And it was just by removing lots of trash. So what would be our next step? So our next step after that would be to give up more of our control over what sequence things are going to be computed and um, where they would be computed. And that could move us from where we are now with NumPy to GPU-based tensors. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please press the subscribe button and we will see you next time.